Our next speaker is Graham Feingold. Good. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, quick acknowledgement uh, to people who I've been working with, particularly Alison McComiskey, Tuck, and some nascent work with uh, Ken Carslow's group. Okay. Um, we've had lots of introductions. Uh, I will just make it very brief. Uh, what drives cloud shortwave radiative forcing to first order uh, properties like the cloud amount, the cloud fraction, uh, the cloud optical depth, or the cloud albedo, the surface albedo, and uh, cloud morphology to some extent. Uh, the challenge we face is process level understanding and observational constraint on aerosol indirect effects. So, I think we all know that the role of the aerosol, and I'm going to be dealing here with shallow clouds, and also a disclaimer, when I talk about forcing, I'm talking about clear uh, versus all sky. I'm not talking about pre-industrial uh, and uh, present day. So the aerosol increases the albedo at constant liquid water path. Uh, the magnitude of that depends on the relationship between drop number and aerosol concentration, and uh, uh, perhaps on, on uh, cloud morphology. The role of the aerosol uh, in albedo is much less predictable for an adjusting cloud system. The albedo is about two and a half times more sensitive to liquid water path than it is to drop concentration. So there is this opportunity for buffering. The aerosol modifies cloud fraction in ways that are hard to quantify. Uh, what is cloud fraction anyway? I'm not going to get into that, but we need to bear that in mind. The aerosol modifies drizzle, which can uh, substantially change the, the cloud fraction. I think this might be one of the key aspects, and Danny raised that. Uh, the aerosol appears to reduce cloud fraction under high loadings. So now I'm going to, I'm going to step back a little and, and be a little more philosophical about this. I'm going to pick up on Ken's point yesterday, which is the question to the extent to which we are limited by uh, methodology or by data and understanding. So this is an attempt to try to uh, give my view, and not just my view, but John Hart's view on approaches to a complex problem. We have the Newtonian approach. The Newtonian approach is this reductionist view of the world. It seeks simplicity, universal laws. It's very much based on initial conditions. It deals with causality, patterns, and it strives for simple models. The Darwinian approach, on the other hand, deals, of course, with very complex systems like our own. And it tends to focus on these complex interdependencies in the system. It tends to reject simplicity. Of course, we can't box individuals into these different categories, but I'd like to just bring into the discussion this tension uh, between the Newtonian and the Darwinian. And frequently, depending on our backgrounds, we tend to fit more or less into one of these categories. If we think about merging the Newtonian and the Darwinian, which is essentially John Hart's uh, call, uh, we need to think about emergence, we need to think about scaling laws, and we need to think about simple models, models that we can falsify. And I'd also like to bring into the discussion uh, Karl Popper's work from 1965, which discusses physical determinism. In Karl Popper's work, he talked about clocks on the one hand. These are very much the predictable um, uh, physically uh, easy to determine their behavior type systems. And then on the other hand, the cloud system. Uh, he used that word cloud, the sort of fuzzy nebulous type of system that is much harder to predict. Let's give an example. This sounds a little esoteric. Uh, we're interested, for example, in relating something like the albedo reflectance to a change, a change in that, to a change in emissions. This comes from Steve Gann's presentation uh, uh, that he gave last year, but was shown yesterday by Rob Wood. So, of course, we could break this down into the various component terms. And Rob went through that yesterday. So let's focus for a second on the optical depth response to the drop concentration. We can expand that further, and we can break that down into 
a Toomey term, and then this uh, change in liquid water with drop number. And what we try to do here is quantify the individual terms, ideally through observations, and we compare models and observations at the level of these individual derivative terms. And we've done this quite a lot over the last decades. But of course, we could take each one of these terms and expand that further. And very quickly, you get down into the weeds. And this is very much the Darwinian approach. It's a complex system. It's full of contingencies. And we dig deeper and deeper because it matters. An example, uh, just trying to quantify that from Andy Ackerman's work. Here is the same expression pretty much I showed you on the previous slide. Here, is observations, here are observations from the mass shift experiment. Change in liquid water as a function of change in N, points all over the place. Change in uh, distribution breadth as a function of N, points all over the place. And Andy makes the statement, we found that Toomey's cloud susceptibility generally represents the measurements well. However, this agreement is fortuitous in these data due to offsetting factors from changes in several parameters. For years and years, and I, this is a mere culprit to some extent, we've been looking at the relationships between effective radius and aerosol, or perhaps drop concentration and a proxy, and looking at some of these relationships like the, the precip susceptibility. These microphysical responses I'll just generally refer to are these, as these DX, D aerosol. Quantifying these terms is a challenge. Sometimes we get results that are plausible. Sometimes they're non-physical. There are measurement errors. There are retrieval errors. And these uncertainties compound. There is scale dependence. We're in an adjusting system. The liquid water is changing. We have advection. These are non-Markovian systems. Small differences in these slopes, these measured responses, magnify to very large differences in the cloud radiative forcing. We've shown that in various papers. So measurements of these microphysical metrics do not constrain the cloud radiative forcing. Well enough, in my opinion. So thinking about more of a Newtonian plus Darwinian view, let's think about systems, the fact that systems often exhibit the system-wide uh, behaviors or emergent properties. And let's take, for example, the albedo versus cloud fraction. These are properties closely related to cloud radiative forcing or cloud radiative effect, if you prefer. Some work from Webb et al. 2001. These are observations. The seen albedo as a function, function of the cloud fraction, a fairly well-defined behavior over here. And here's another example from uh, Frida Bender's work, the albedo versus cloud fraction, and a fairly linear relationship. These relationships are useful. Down at zero cloud fraction, you're essentially seeing the surface albedo, and at a cloud fraction of one, you're seeing the cloud albedo. Another quick example I don't have time to go into is the fact that instead of comparing these microphysical responses, we can look at PDFs of things like the downward irradiance, things that really matter. This happens to be under a cloud, and this is between the clouds. The point I'm getting at here is to match between LES simulations and observations, we really need to get both the cloud field right and the aerosol field right. And there's also spectral information buried here. And Sebastian Schmidt has done a fair amount of work on this that I don't think we're using uh, to, to uh, our advantage. So if we're going to merge these uh, approaches, I would like to suggest we identify these uh, emergent relationships. We explore how they vary across regime. Uh, look at how they change over a range of temp uh, spatial temporal scales. And I'll give you some examples in the coming slides from some cloud resolving modeling of stratocumulus, some large eddy simulation of, of a transition from stratocumulus to cumulus, and also some observations from, uh, from SGP. Just one brief slide on how we set the model up. This is the SAM model. For those who are interested, we have a uh, broad definition of, uh, well, we have five parameters that define meteorological variables for the initial conditions. And we have an aerosol concentration representing the, the, the aerosol effect. The range of conditions, the initial conditions are over here. We subsample all of these 
these different ranges to get liquid water path between 35 and 200 grams per meter squared and a cloud base between 250 and 1100. So we're broadly looking at a range of different kinds of uh, stratocumulus clouds. Um, the second set of simulations will actually come from a sounding from a stratocumulus to cumulus transition case. Well, we did 100 simulations with fixed increments in initial conditions. And we did another 120 with Latin hypercube sampling of those initial conditions. The key issue here is that these two sets have different joint PDFs of the initial conditions. Neither of which, by the way, represents real atmospheric conditions. And that's in some senses deliberate, but it was also very fortuitous. And the question then is, what are the cloud albedo controlling parameters? Well, if we throw all the points, and now we're looking at albedo, this is the, the, the scene albedo, but I'm ignoring the surface albedo, so surface albedo is zero. Each point over here is the average over the last hour of a six-hour simulation. And here we have vapor, theta L, the jumps in, in vapor and theta L, the depth of the mixed layer, and the aerosol concentration. And it's pretty clear when you look at, a, at those uh, points that there isn't much of a pattern in any of these. It suggests that everything matters. Now we've colored the points over here by a liquid water path, and then you start to see things separating out a little bit by uh, the, the, the liquid water path itself. If we did a uh, multivariate correlation, this is a cumulative multivariate correlation, Albedo is a function of these individual parameters plus the aerosol. You can see that everything matters. Some things seem to matter more than others. The depth of the mixed layer. The aerosol does seem to matter over here, but everything matters. Here is the second set. This is the Latin hypercube sampled set. You can see here that the, uh, the, the sampling looks different. The points are scattered differently in phase space. Um, you can, I'm sorry, these are, this is still this, the first set, I apologize. This is fixed increments. This is exactly what you saw before, uh, except now I'm showing you the albedo is a function of liquid water path, and the albedo is a function of cloud fraction. And now we start seeing things starting to uh, 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 set up quite nicely along a curve, a well-defined curve, albedo versus cloud fraction, much like Frieda Bender saw. And of course, albedo versus liquid water path. The separation is very clear, and the separation over here is also very clear. Here is the Latin hypercube sampling uh, result, a little different uh, from the previous one. Uh, again, the points look different in phase space. You can't really make much sense of all of this. Uh, but when you look at things in a liquid water path uh, world here, albedo and cloud fraction, you can see this very clear separation of the colors indicating the dominance of liquid water path. Um, just as a sanity check, zooming in on the uh, albedo susceptibility, we're looking at albedo as a function of aerosol over here for the first set, for the second set, uh, separated by liquid water path. You can see the stronger slopes over here, and the maximum slope is at lower N and at albedos of about 0.5, exactly as predicted by Toomey. So this is according to our, uh, our understanding of the system. All right, let's just go back quickly to Frieda Bender's work. Uh, th these relationships seem to apply in different regimes, different times of the day. Let's just take this Californian uh, terror result for reference and look at how the model output looks compared to that. Total scene albedo now. So we've made adjustments in order to compare with Bender, uh, made adjustments uh, for the surface albedo. And when the aerosol is present, it changes the surface albedo. And here is our scattering of points in seen albedo versus cloud fraction. And you see the generally increasing relationship over here. And you see a separation of the colors to some extent. Here is the Toomey effect, if you like. Here is the influence of the aerosol. Uh, by the way, the fact that we have curvature here implies that we have a relationship between the, uh, the cloud fraction and the, and, and the cloud albedo. So they're not independent of one another. It's a relatively weak aerosol influence, though, I would say. Uh, I superimpose over here three points that Sebastian calculated. The red pluses 
uh, over here. And you can see, and these are based on 3D radiative transfer. You can see that those points fit quite nicely on the curve. Here is the second set. Exactly the same analysis, just a different sampling of the joint PDFs of the initial conditions. And here we see more curvature, and we do not see a separation of the colors. In other words, we do not see any aerosol effect or very little aerosol effect, I would argue, in these points. The curvature uh, obviously depends on the sampled conditions. And by the way, it also depends very much on how you define a cloud. Uh, for uh, weaker conditions, you would find even stronger curvature. And that, I think, is something we need to be cognizant of. So a question then is, how does the joint PDF of those initial conditions, or the conditions that the atmosphere presents to us, influence the shape of that curve? I think that's something worth pursuing. Before uh, getting back to that, I'd like to just look briefly at cloud forcing. Again, this is an all sky, clear sky type issue, and I'm normalizing over here, so we will call that the relative cloud radiative forcing. And these are equations that are well known, and in fact, that they date back to work that Ramanathan and others did uh, quite some time ago. And again, we're interested now in what are the cloud radiative forcing controlling parameters. So these results come from the transition case. This is stratocumulus to cumulus transition. The conditions are quite clean. Uh, we happen to have a low single scattering albedo for reasons that you will understand shortly. And again, the seen albedo is a function of cloud fraction. And you can see over the course of three days how these points migrate from a high uh, forcing or a high seen albedo, high cloud fraction, to a broken cloud scene. What's interesting, though, is that we look here at two points very close to one another. The color scheme is not great here. But we have a green point next to a yellow point. They sit almost on top of one another. That means that the combination of albedo and cloud fraction is not unique in terms of indicating the cloud radiative forcing. Now we add smoke to the scene. The smoke is now in the boundary layer. It's not a loft as in some of the examples that we're interested in from outflows from Africa. But now we have increased the aerosol optical depth to 0.5, the same low single scattering albedo. These particles absorb. They change the vertical structure of the atmosphere. And if we flip back, you can see the fact that we have now uh, brightened the surface and brightened the cloud. Whoop. Okay. Well, I superimpose over here a completely different simulation, which is now a stratocumulus breaking up into open cells, and it's uh, a series of points here over the course of, of, a few hour, of, of a few hours just with lots of sampling. And what's interesting is it's a completely different sounding from the other, and yet it seems to fit very nicely on the same total scene albedo versus cloud fraction plot. Uh, we can break the cloud radiative forcing, uh, or we can break those previous plots into forcing versus albedo, uh, colored by cloud fraction. And there is that uh, uh, curve that we get from that. And we can also break it into forcing as a function of cloud fraction, now colored by albedo. And of course, we see that increase in the um, uh, forcings associated with the increase in albedo. These are just different ways of looking at the same data. Why do I show you plots of this kind? Because we can now start looking at surface-based measurements. Of course, we could do it from, from, uh, this, from space as well. These are some observations from 20 years of data at SGP. The, the cloud rated of forcing over here as a function of cloud albedo. That's Im important. This is specifically the cloud albedo. Uh, not the seen albedo, and the same as a function of cloud fraction. But we can uh, put these side to side. These are different regimes completely. And I've uh, taken the envelope slope over here and uh, superimposed it on this. But the, 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 these slopes are different. They're slightly different. That might be important. But at least we can start looking at the differences and why we have differences of that kind. And here, too, I've put these uh, plus points over here, which come from roughly from the center of this curve of points. And you can start seeing differences in the curvature, and we can start thinking about why. But we're, the key is we're addressing the key aspects of the system, not the subcomponents. <clears throat> 
Okay, so I've got to get now into a proposed strategy uh, for what, how we take this, where we go with this. The modeling exercise um, has been for idealized meteorological con conditions, and they do not represent reality. The joint PDFs, the way we sampled them, doesn't have anything to do with reality other than the fact that the range of the, the initial conditions was reasonable. What we require is realistic joint PDFs of the drivers, the initial conditions. And we could get these from reanalysis, from NWP, or perhaps from, from variational analysis. And so I think that a way forward here, at least from the process level aspect of this, is the routine LES, cloud resolving modeling, that has been done already at, in KNMI in, in, in Cabal, Holland, and is also a project that DOE uh, ARM is going to be pursuing. Uh, the idea is to identify albedo and cloud fraction controlling parameters, regime by regime. Some footnotes over here, others have looked at this too. It's not uh, necessarily uh, that new. When we do this on a regular basis, though, successful res the successful simulations represent observationally constrained model output, and those are particularly useful. The unsuccessful ones uh, are uh, good material for trying to understand why the model is not performing well. And we have this additional benefit of consistently and methodically improving the models. A few years ago, we proposed something much uh, less ambitious. The idea here was to get joint PDFs of aerosol, liquid water, and vertical velocity, uh, and we were going to get those from data, either ground-based, uh, in-situ aircraft, or satellites, and we're going to, we were going to run those through cloud parcel models. And we would then be sampling realistic joint PDFs of key parameters, some of which have been identified here in this room, we would then look at model output, and the idea was plot the cloud optical depth as a function of the aerosol, get at one of those microphysical responses that I was uh, a little bit down on earlier. I'm not saying we shouldn't pursue this at all. I think we do need to be looking at some of these more detailed responses. We just need to be aware of the uncertainties. But what we'd like to do now is get observationally based joint PDFs of the meteorology and the aerosol, feed those into uh, large eddy simulations or cloud resolving models, look at the model outputs, evaluate it against the observations, and then start looking at these plots of forcing as a function of cloud fraction or albedo as a function of cloud fraction. Uh, these parameters can be measured from the ground and they can be measured from space. The other aspect to this which we've been pursuing is development of an emulator. This is following on from work in Ken's group. Uh, instead of focusing on parametric uncertainty that Ken has been looking at, we're interested here in uncertainty in the albedo, for example, or the cloud fraction or the forcing due to changes in initial conditions. The same initial conditions I, for example, chose in those previous simulations. This is work in progress. Uh, these are first this is one first example of an emulator result. Uh, we're looking here at the cloud albedo, uh, the uh, depth of the mixed layer on this axis, and, this is, uh, um, and the aerosol on that axis. So this is a cloud alb albedo surface in boundary layer depth uh, and aerosol um, concentration phase space. And you can see it's a fairly steep uh, uh, um, surface, and so building this emulator has not been trivial. But by running emulators, we can start filling in much more of the space. So how might we go about doing this? Here on the left column is your data. Uh, we've got parameters like liquid water path, cloud optical depth, aerosol, radiation, surface fluxes. In the modeling side, we take daily numerical weather prediction, variational, variational, analysis, for, for variational analysis for the initial conditions. We drive our process models. We do it regularly. We get statistics. We generate albedo, cloud fraction, and perhaps forcing output from the process models. We compare with the observations. And we add to that the fact that single column models should be brought into the mix because by doing this, and these can be run very efficiently, we can compare with the process models and identify issues in the single column models the way that KPT did in, in Holland. And again, we can compare 
the albedo cloud fraction across in this direction, and the forcing as well. Now, by bringing the single column models into this picture, uh, we can essentially directly uh, improve the uh, general circulation models, and then we can start getting at present day minus pre-industrial, which is something I've glossed over. So in summary, uh, going back to Karl Popper and his very philosophical uh, clocks and clouds, uh, we don't deal here with a clock-like system. It's an open system. It's an incredibly complex system. And in, in Popper's words, it's more uh, cloud-like than it is clock-like. It's fuzzy, and we have to live with that fuzziness to some degree. But I think within that fuzziness, we can start trying to look at properties of the system, like these albedo cloud fraction or the forcing in albedo cloud fraction space, look at the uh, things like emergence, look at uh, scale dependence, which seems to be weak. I was comparing plots that came from large eddy simulations, cloud resolving models, with things that came from satellite that's averaged over two and a half degrees over the course of a month. We can, I think it, it makes more sense to get at the averaging at that level rather than the averaging at the level of the microphysical response. Uh, we can constrain and evaluate models of different scales using these particular uh, uh, properties. These independent microphysical responses we've spent so much time on are useful. I don't want to suggest we throw them out, but they're highly uncertain. And I think we need to be careful about that. And then I'm suggesting we engage in routine process modeling and observations. Capture the covariance of key cloud controlling parameters with the aerosol. This is really central to this approach. Link the albedo with the cloud fraction paths to covariances of the controlling parameters. Understand the effects of scale and place on the parameters that matter most, not necessarily things like effective radius. The observationally constrained model output from this kind of exercise could be used for a variety of, uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, it could uh, improve single column models and uh, GCM improvements that would then help us address present day minus pre-industrial. And then finally, this emulator development will be very useful, I think, to more fully explore parameter space for different regimes. Thanks. <laughs>